Hi, welcome to the DRH show where I have wide ranging conversations with interesting people. We talk about all things psychology, mental health and wellness. And today I'm joined by an author and a mental health advocate, Aidan Martin. Thanks for joining me. I have him. It's very good to be here. I'm really excited to have you here, Aidan. So let's kick this off with you telling us your background, your trajectory in life and how you ended up doing what you're doing. No problem. So I grew up in a working class lifestyle um, in an area called Livingston in Scotland. Livingston is a new town and I was born in 86, so it was only about 20 odd years old. So it was still in development and I grew up in a, an area within Livingston called Ladywell, which had pros and cons to it. It was a place where there was a lot of community, but for a young male growing up, there was a lot of violence. And, you know, the high school that I went to was one of the poorest schools, probably the poorest school in the area um, at that time. We had sort of league tables that the school would be part of for educational attainment and behaviour and violence and all that kind of stuff. And it was always bottom of the league table for those kinds of things. Uh, we had people that were so badly bullied, they ended up on the, the national news talking about how suicidal the bullying made them feel. So growing up in that kind of environment meant that I never really had any aspirations for the future. I didn't have any self-worth or self-esteem when I left school aged 16 uh, with no qualifications, with no footing to the housing market, no career aspirations. Uh, I didn't really have any ideas about a future and that led me you know straight into a substance abuse addiction lifestyle which had already started when i was at school uh, by the time i was 13 and 14 i was already involved with drinking alcohol and taking substances and addicted to hardcore pornography as well so a lot of unhealthy behaviors from a young age and unhealthy coping mechanisms from a young age as well and that's kind of a very brief overview of the, the upbringing. It's such really a powerful story, Aidan, and thank you for your honesty in, in, in sharing that story. And uh, as we can clearly see right now that you've managed to successfully bounce back, so to speak. And um, just like what I've mentioned earlier, you wrote a book and I would imagine this is um, the content of your book. So if you could just talk us through more about your book and, and the inspiration about it and who, who supported you along the way in writing this book. No problem. So, you know, when I started writing the book, I, I realized before I started writing it that I'd gone through enough traumas in my life to have lasted three lifetimes. I'd, I'd suffered a lot of different types of trauma and gone through a lot of different types of things, not just me, but my family. And it's kind of that throwaway saying, you know, or you could write a book about that, but I really believed I could write a book about it. Now, I was always passionate about writing. I liked writing poetry, and I was influenced by Kurt Cobain and, and Eminem, the rapper, as far as them writing lyrics. It made me feel like I could get my pain out and my trauma out through the written words. Um, and I'd done that from my young age, but once I got involved in a heavy drug addiction lifestyle, the addiction took over. And so it wasn't until a long time later that you know, I, I, my life has changed around and I'm, I'm clean and I just got this urge. You know, someone in my family died and after they died, I got this urge to write a book and to talk about all the different things that had happened. Um, I mean, there's, there's lots of different types of trauma I've gone through. I don't want to be too graphic, but one of the, the main things was that, you know, the, the internet first came around when I was 13 and I ended up speaking to an older man in chat rooms and this person went on to, to groom and exploit me and it took me almost 20 years to even understand what had happened during that period of my childhood. And so that was the first chapter of the book. I knew I had to address that and how that impacted the rest of my life. Um, but you know, certainly 
that was one trauma, but there was still, I mean, there were traumas to come, and there were there were things that were out with my control, you know, like child cancer that happened in my family twice. I, I think what we can um, take, take from your book is that it's it's a story of lived experience, and it's not just a story of lived experience, but ultimately it's the story of recovery. And um, I, I would imagine, you, you know, when we talk about someone struggling with their with their um, traumatic life experiences, there's a number of factors, um, like what you've alluded to earlier, um, the internet, um, the, the kind of community that you grew up with. But in the same vein, um, when you when you go to the process of recovery, there's also a constellation of factors which you know um, kind of contribute to how you've recovered. Um, so if you could talk to us um, um, how important um, education is has been to your life, and presumably there's also a sense of identity that has also contributed to you know you know um, being towards in a, in a in a better better stage right now. Yeah. So. As I say, I left high school like most other people that went to that school with no qualifications and no one, you know, none of the, the boys I grew up with and in the street I went, uh, I grew up in and, and the school I went to would have thought about college or university or any kind of further education. And it wasn't until I was in my mid-twenties where I had this idea that I was going to try and go to college and I went to college and done my health and social care course, just an introductory course. And it was at West Lothian College, which is the local college to where I live. And that was groundbreaking for me as a person for more than one reason. First of all, it was the first time in my life where I realised I wasn't daft, that I wasn't an idiot. Like I say, I left school thinking that I was just daft, I had no qualifications and, and that was it. School was all about survival and, and getting through the violence and everything else. So going to college was the first time in my life where I realised actually I'm not stupid. And the lecturers there nurtured my mind and my soul and they would give me positive affirmations and every day they'd be telling me how bright I was and how much a future I could have and how successful my life could be. and. I started to unravel all the false ideas I grew up with, again, like many other people who grew up in my area, that there was only so far I could go in life, and they made me believe that I could build the, the kind of life I wanted, whatever I wanted to do. Now, at that stage, I didn't quite know where I wanted to take it all. It was just taking it one step at a time. But it was the, the belief and the confidence that they built up in me to even imagine having a life that was different to the one I'd known, which was all about drugs and violence and going from relationship to relationship with women and never having proper structure and and so it was really groundbreaking and then the other side of the coin was the theoretical stuff like psychology and criminology and sociology and learning these theoretical reasons as to why young men like I had been ended up in a life of crime or in a life of addiction or suicide or having terrible mental health and so it was really, truly groundbreaking for me. And, you know, I've done three years of college. I got a HNC in social sciences, went to university, um, graduated with a 2-1 in social sciences, criminology and sociology. And now I'm back at university again. And I'm almost finished a master's degree in social work. And that is unheard of from where I came from. And no one in my family had been to university. No one in my street had gone to college or uni. And it really was groundbreaking for my whole entire life. That, that is really a heartwarming story and um, your, your story about you know um, being able to mobilize yourself through education that really um, resonates with me because we kind of share similar background although um, as you could tell I was born in a different country. Um, I, I grew up in a slum in the Philippines and I was also the first in the family to go to university. Um, um, just like you, I could not imagine myself going to university, but it was my parents who encouraged me because um, they've never been to university themselves. And they told me that if you really want to get out of the slum, the best way to do that is through education. And just, just like how, you know, you've managed it, um, education really opens up doors. But I suppose it's kind of a different dynamic with you. Um, and I, I don't mean it to sound offensive, um, but um, I, 
Uh, I was working as a teaching assistant a few years ago at a local college. I'm, I'm based here in Essex, and a lot of um, a lot of students who are actually actually struggling, based from my own, own experience, they're actually um, working class boys, mm -hmm. working class white boys. And sometimes when we talk about you know inclusion and diversity, this tends to be the the demographic that we don't really pay attention to. And um, what, what I find intriguing is that if you go, if you if you look up statistics, um, these are actually men that don't actually receive support. And just, just like I would I would imagine that's the, that's the same case for you because um, sometimes um, because of you know kind of for, for lack of a better term obsessions about di diversity and inclusion, we tend to focus on on minority on women. And don't, don't get me wrong, I, I don't I don't mean to. To sound like um, it's, it's it's a bad practice, but sometimes, in an obsession to do that, we tend to forget um, the the group that is truly marginalised. And as in your case, um, you, you've said that um, from from your community, a lot of people haven't been gone, have have not been to university. Um, so what I'm interested to hear from you, Aiden, is if you, if you could just um, talk us more about the kind of community that you grew up with, um, the childhood experiences um, that yeah, that you had. Yeah, so like I say, it was there were some beautiful parts to where I grew up because everyone knew each other's name and whenever the ice cream van came out, everybody'd go out and, and get their, their sweets and all that and you'd play football on the street with all the other kids and you'd play outdoors and that kind of you know, that kind of way of life isn't really as active as it was back then, having kids out in the street all the time. But the older I got, the more territorial it became. And it became really dangerous and dangerous to the point where you could literally just turn a corner and if you saw a group of other young lads you know you were taking a risk if you were walking past them you were taking a risk to get jumped or stabbed or and it was always gang fights and weapons and it just got and the older you got the more extreme that got and you know at the time i don't think any of us realized that we were part of what was now we terms a lad culture we didn't know that it was the lad culture we didn't know that at the time we just had these rules that we were all born into and, and those rules were like you know you don't talk about your feelings you don't show weakness you don't show fear and if you do you're going to be an easy target and you know we certainly if, if any of my friends had been gay they'd have been too scared to admit it because the whole thing was you act like like a, like a macho man and we didn't even know what that was really we were just all wee boys trying to play it being men and we thought that you took drugs and, and you, you pulled women and you fought and, and stick your fingers up to authority and all that kind of stuff and like you don't grass and all these kind of rules and the thing is we, we were all born into those rules and we all played by those rules and for some people the older we got the more dangerous that got some people ended up dying overdosing or being murdered or ended up in jail or institutions and you know of all the people i grew up with most of them are still really badly impacted by mental health and addiction or they've just been incarcerated and came out or institutionalized very very few of the people i knew in fact, of my friends, only one of us ended up not becoming an addict and not becoming someone with substance abuse issues. So the numbers don't add up there. I just want to touch upon what you mentioned about lad culture. Um, of course, um, as you've mentioned, this is really one of the things that really affect men about their, how they present themselves and ultimately it has an impact on their mental health and well-being. But on the other side of the spectrum, there's also what we call um, toxic masculinity. And it seems like it's really a polarizing, um, it's really a polarizing concept. So I was just interested to hear from you. What do you think about um, the idea of toxic masculinity where too much of being masculine is really bad? Um, whereas um, other researchers that um, it's just, it's just being resilient, it's just being able to, um, you know, exercise fortitude and greed. But sometimes the media and the researchers, um, especially the feminists, try to frame it into a different narrative. So um, what, what do you make of the word toxic masculinity? Uh, I can't stand it. And um, the reason I can't stand it is because I don't even think 
all those behaviours we had were linked to our perception of masculinity per se. I think class inequalities and class disadvantages impacted the way of life we were all involved in. You know, we didn't get a proper education because of class, because the school was very poor. Um, if we'd had a proper education, then perhaps we would have not thought the way we did. If the streets weren't so violent, perhaps we wouldn't have thought we had to be that way. I don't think it's because that someone taught us this is what it means to be a man. A lot of us didn't know our biological fathers. I didn't know mine. So I understand why the phrase can get used, and there's probably so many different angles to it, but I just think it's too too lazy a phrase there are men killing them in Scotland. There are men killing themselves in record numbers. There, there are men that incarcerated in record numbers. Mental health, addiction, overdose. Men are suffering in record numbers. I don't know how the phrase toxic masculinity is helpful to that. I also, you know, one of, one of my jobs in the past was a support worker. And I supported, I was a domestic abuse support worker in the criminal justice system. And I supported female victims who were abused by other females. I don't know how the term toxic masculinity explains any of that, you know. And most of that time it was an age thing. It was um, an older woman would exploit a younger woman. Um, and this can, you know, I, I was a victim of exploitation from an older man. But the older man that exploited me, he didn't come from a lab culture background. Uh, he wasn't that kind of character whatsoever. So the term toxic masculinity didn't help explain what happened to me either. And for a long time, there was nowhere for me to go for support. You know, when the Me Too movement came out, which was, you know, I'm, I'm glad that movement happened. I'm glad, you know, predominantly it is women that are victims and it is men that are perpetrators. I believe the evidence would argue in favor of that. But there are other types of victims and other types of perpetrators. and when the Me Too movement was you know, at its peak, it didn't do me any favours because it didn't really talk about male victims and male abusers or any other type of scenario. It just talked mostly about male perpetrators and female victims. And so I felt lost in that conversation. And again, when toxic masculinity is thrown around as a phrase, I'm like, I don't understand how that explains that. I think we're living in a society right now where everything's extremely political. Now that can be good, you know, there's a place for radical politics, but sometimes it goes from being radical to being extremism, extremism, and I don't know how the phrase toxic masculinity is helpful. I think it overlooks many things, many other factors for why people end up how they do. And I think it can be weaponized by certain parts of society, not all, but certain parts of society may weaponize that phrase to further their own agendas, in my opinion. That, like what you've said, when you're trying to um, politicize um, certain sectors which are not meant to be politicized, like mental health or, or the, the talking um, profession, psychology, um, counseling, you tend to marginalize um, certain individuals such as, you know, yourself, um, white straight men. Um, and the, just like what you've said, um, toxic masculinity can do more harm than, you know, benefit um, who is supposed to be benefiting um, within, you know, the talking therapist. Now, aside from toxic masculinity, um, another thing that tend to stigmatize um, people, um, not, not just, you know, not just men, but anyone who's suffering with mental health condition is um, the stigmatizing language. Um, of course, we've made a significant progress now. Um, the media have moved away from, you know, um, stigmatizing language surrounding mental health. But sometimes there's still language that tend to slip through the net, such as the word junkie. And I understand you have some strong opinions about the word junkie. Um, could you expand on this? Yeah, I just think that the word itself is loaded, it's used as a derogatory term. Now we're living in times where when someone makes a mistake with terminology, they can find themselves in a lot of trouble. Whether it's through ignorance or it's an honest mistake, they can still find themselves in a lot of trouble getting accused of maybe a hate crime. Now we should always work harder to understand other people's inequalities and to use language that is more appropriate and 
this day and age and it's not hurtful and not harmful. And I just feel like the word junkie is still something that is, is tolerated. It's not only tolerated, it's used quite often. And I see it all the time. And I, I see it from people who are respected professionals. Uh, I see it from people who I actually view as good human beings with good hearts that wouldn't mean to cause harm to anyone. So it might be that there's an ignorance or it's just that people are blasé about it because it's always been used. Now, don't get me wrong. There are, there are many addicts you know, that I know that will use the word to describe themselves. But I think if someone's been through addiction, it's okay for them to take ownership of that word and, and use it in a kind of jokey kind of way, you know, as, as humorous. But when someone who has never experienced this is using it as a, again, if they're weaponizing the word to hurt someone, then it's still hateful. Now, I don't believe in cancel culture. I don't like cancel everyone down who uses the word junkie. But I wouldn't mind having a cup of coffee and a conversation with them and explaining why that word can be damaging. And many people come out of addiction and turn their lives around. If someone's even getting the courage to think about turning their life around and you keep telling them they're nothing but a junkie, you're reinforcing all that negative self-belief that that person has anyway and perhaps stopping them from trying to get help because you're making them think that they're subhuman and they're worthless and this isn't true and someone else you know it's okay calling someone a junkie but it could end up being your son or daughter or your neighbor or your your sibling or your parent or your best friend it could be them that has an addiction problem and then the word junkie might not be something you want to use anymore because you wouldn't want the person you love to be demeaned like that so I am in a place in life where I like to have open conversations. I don't want to shut people down who think that word's okay. I would like them to think about the word and maybe just think about not using it. And I suppose it also becomes a sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. The more you tell people that they're actually junky, um, the more they re the more they think for themselves that you know uh, there's no way out of here. Um, and I, I suppose this what triggered you to launch your own campaign uh, for, for changes in drug policy, am I right? Yeah, definitely, because when your government, any government, refuses to treat addiction like a health problem and, and they do treat it more like a crime problem, then that in itself is stigmatising. It reinforces the idea that addiction is just morally inferior behaviour, socially deviant behaviour, these old mentalities. But there's a lot of evidence out there now that says, okay, people that suffer with addiction, I mean, addiction can happen to anyone. I'm not saying it's only a class thing, but there's a disproportionate amount of people from disadvantaged backgrounds and people with trauma and adverse childhood experiences and sometimes all those things together. And if someone's gone through all those barriers in, in society and end up in a life of addiction and, and they're then getting labeled as a junkie, they're definitely being treated like someone who doesn't deserve help, who's less worthy of help than someone else. On the other side of the coin, as someone who lived in addiction, I done very selfish things in my addiction to feed my habit. And one of the worst things I ever done was, you know, my little brother had cancer treatment. He was dying of cancer. And I helped raise money for his cancer treatment. I then started stealing some of that money. I got caught doing it very early on and never stole very much, but that's besides the point. I've done something horrendous to feed my habit. And I understand that when these things are on show and people see this stuff, it's easy to think, oh, they're just a junkie because of the terrible thing that has been done. But what people who are not familiar with that world probably see is the end result. They see the chaos, they see the person at the worst, and they might not see all the stuff that's led up to that got that person to that level of desperation and deprivation you know something must have happened to get them to that point nobody ever wakes up and decides they want to be that person um so it is a complex conversation to be had and i think because there's so many people who may not fully understand it it's not in my nature to jump down people's throats so i'm not gonna block everyone who doesn't see addiction like i see it I would ask people to have an open mind and some patience and tolerance and be willing to discuss it with an open mind and an open heart. 
absolutely and now let's talk about um your another book because i understand um you you also have another a second book so um what what's your second book about it's yeah. called it's called where the fuck is phil and then what I'm, it's a fiction this time i would say it's about 50 percent memoir and 50 percent fiction and what i've decided to do with this is look very specifically at a period of time in the early 2000s when I feel my involvement in lad culture was at its peak. And I'm going to look at, well, what I'm looking at is the, the, the driving factors for why us lads just wanted to do the same thing over and over. Drink, drugs, party, go to raves, sleep with women, bounce from relationship to relationship. And I'm putting a bit of an outlandish story into it, as well as a lot of real life factors. And whilst I want it to be entertaining and something that people can enjoy and, and get nostalgia from and laugh at and feel emotional about and maybe even shed a tear, I want to try and give an explanation as to why certain lads at a certain time behaved how they did because we didn't understand the concept of masculinity or all the politics behind it. We didn't understand. We didn't even know we we're part of a lad culture, you know, this term lad culture. We didn't know that's what we were doing. It's only now as an adult that I've had therapy and education and recovery that I can look back and I can determine, okay, these are the reasons, the factors as to why we were all like that. And as I say, so many of my friends and, and young lads that I assumed were enemies back in the day, excuse me, so many of them are still in that kind of place in life. And it's not because they're bad people. No, they're, they're good people with big hearts and loads of talent and loads of potential, but they were part of the same system that I believe failed them and have never fully managed to find their way out of it. Now, I also am in recovery, so I believe in being accountable and being accountable for my own choices in life. But when you've had a start that sets you up for failure, it gets harder and harder to start taking accountability for your life because there's not too many options for you. And we're sold this dream of happiness all the time, you know, have a family and a, a nice car and a nice house and go on holidays and all that. But if you leave school at 16 and you've got no qualifications and you're full of trauma and you've already got an addiction problem and you've already got severe mental health and where you grew up is, is rife with violence and perhaps your role model, your potential role models were role models because they suffered as well and there's no housing and there's just a whole plethora of reasons why you're not going to succeed. It's very hard to be accountable for your choices when there's not many choices to be accountable for. You're such an inspiring man, Aiden. And I would imagine a lot of people would like to follow your footsteps, especially in becoming an author. So do you have any tips for anyone who want to write their first book? So what I made sure to do was, I, I knew in my heart what I wanted to write about. I didn't go looking at what other people wrote. I didn't compare what I was doing to anyone else's. I mean, it might be good for someone to model themselves on someone else, but I just knew I needed to write what I was writing. And I wanted to finish it before I even looked at the process of how you get a book out there. Once I was finished it and I knew I had something, then I started researching what I've actually written. I didn't know it was called a memoir. I didn't know that in its raw form it was a manuscript. I didn't know that you had to get an agent if you wanted to contact a big publisher. Um, I didn't know that you could potentially contact an independent publisher without an agent. I learned all this by trial and error. If you really do want to write something and you do want to get it out there, I would say start with just writing what you want to write. Some people will tell you go away and research the market and all that, and a lot of agents and stuff will, will ask you that question. But I would advise doing that in the beginning because then you might end up trying to write something that you think other people want to read. The chances are if you've got an idea of what you want to write, there'll be other people that want to read that kind of thing, I believe. And I won't mind purely on that feeling inside that I like the idea of writing all this down. It's real life. It's as raw and as, as good as you're going to get. It's cathartic for me, but I do believe that people like to read about this stuff, especially if there's a positive outcome at the end. A new mind's had a positive ending, even though there's a lot of trauma. And so I didn't get distracted by anything else. I just stuck to what my own gut and heart was telling me to do. And then after that, I would say, don't take rejection personally. I got rejected about, I'd say 98% of the time 
sometimes I didn't even get an email back and that's just par for the course you know agents and publishers to get these um, submissions every week probably get thousands a week and most people have to go to a publisher through an agent and I was also a working class guy didn't have any degree in writing you know, I got a degree at uni and other subjects but I had no degree in writing no qualifications in writing at all no CV about being a writer I'd never written so much as an article before I, I knew I could write but I had nothing as far as a CV to back that up I also didn't have a following on social media that's one thing someone could do I guess they could build up their social media platform because that's a head start if you've got people following you but I had to get my social media platform built up after I got my book contract so perseverance if you really believe in this don't take rejections personally persevere like I spoke to people who wanted to submit a potential manuscript and they sent it to a handful of agents and publishers and then just waited to hear back to me that was a naive way about it I sent it to about 20 publishers and agents every day and I researched and I researched and I researched and I looked on each agent and each publisher's sort of criteria for what they were looking for what specifics they wanted because every pitch has to be different according to what person you're pitching it to and you don't pitch to all these agents at the same time and an email you don't send to all you have to do it individually so I just I kept a spreadsheet of who I'd sent to and I sent to like 20 or 30 a day for months and months and months until I eventually got somewhere that's some kind of dedication to to have a spreadsheet and have a goal of at least um 30 pictures a day um let, so let's plug your book um remind us again of the title of your book and i would imagine this is available on amazon yes my book is called euphoric recall um it's currently available on paperback and ebook and it will be available soon on audiobook you can get it on amazon you can go to gutspublishing.com that's my publisher's website you can order it from Waterstones and pretty much just Google it and it'll come up in all the different places that it's available. I'll definitely put those um, on the description box. So for anyone who's interested to buy your book, um, they can get it on Amazon. Um, of course, aside from your book, you're really into writing and you've contributed an article in Sackridge where you mentioned that um, males that you are, you grew up with are struggling. Um, for those who hasn't who have not read the article, if you could just expand on that. Yeah, again, it's, it's um, kind of goes back to what we spoke about. There's so uh, the, the numbers right now for suicide and addiction and incarceration and, and mental health and overdose in Scotland for men is, is so disproportionate. And it just seems to be that at the same time, this toxic masculinity phrase is, is flying about. And, and in no way am I sitting here saying that, that men have suffered the same kind of inequalities as other people. I would never ever state that but i think at times we're being overlooked as being people that are just full of privilege the scheme i grew up in no one had privilege yeah of course in different situations you know a, a man could abuse a woman and that would be a form of using his power over someone but in the terms of opportunity and chances of creating a life where I grew up, it didn't matter what your skin colour was or your gender. It was, to me, a class thing. It was, it was a definite class issue. And I didn't see a lot of privilege um, for anybody, anyone there, regardless of their background. But now there's all these men, I believe, that are struggling. They have a lack of identity, a lack of purpose. There's a lack of industry, I think, as well, to build a career around and... There's a lot of pressure as well, I think, on men as to, I don't know, I, I feel like we're getting pelted from all sides at the moment. And again, I'm very, very careful not to compare being male to anything else. I know that, you know, I know women are still fighting for rights that they should never have had to have gone through so much. But I, I know that, um, you know, people of, of colour have had much worse inequalities mm -hmm. than I will have had. But mm -hmm. in, in, in a general sense, I don't think that men have it easy either. And I think now more than ever, the number, and certainly in Scotland, the numbers are showing that, you know, and 
I look at these guys I grew up with and I'm, I feel helpless and powerless as to what to do for them. There seems to be a real lack of any support for them and direction for them. And I feel like they were failed just as much as anybody else. And even though I speak a lot about growing up in a lad culture, I really, really wish the conversation was less about gender and more about what human beings need. Yeah, that, that is really a good message. And, and um, it really resonates with me what you said, that more than, I suppose, what they call white privilege or, or um, the, the privilege of being man, it's really class privilege, because that really you know dictates the kind of opportunity that you will have in life. Um, now, you, earlier you explained um, the sort of damage that toxic masculinity brings about. So, But, but for you, what ex exactly is masculinity? I think... You know, there's there's so many stereotypes to what masculinity should be. I don't think it's helpful, and, and this doesn't matter if what what gender you identify with. I think we are surrounded in our culture by what we should look like. You know, so all these, and I'm not taking pops at social influencers and stuff, but you know, they all tend to like like for some of the men will be on steroids and they'll be big built and they'll be covered in tattoos and. You know, one of the things I struggled with was body dysmorphia. And the reason I struggled with body dysmorphia is because I felt like I needed to be massive, really big and built. And I also felt like I had to be covered in tattoos. Now, I love tattoos and I'm, I've got loads of them. And I don't regret them. But it was still part of my illness. And I think that society helped create that illness. And I think it happens to doesn't matter what gender you are, I think there are expectations on how we think we should look. Um, and that's one one part of the problem is that some some men might not feel good enough because they're not big and bulky enough. I mean, I remember seeing porridge adverts on the telly and it's, it's a big, massive, bulky guy. And he's, he's got an axe and he's chopping up wood and stuff and that's just for porridge, do you know what I mean? And, and then on the other side of the coin, I feel like so much in society is sexualized you know, like a perfume advert comes on the telly and it's, just, it's a sexualized thing. Um, and I just think, I think it's very confusing as to what we're supposed to see as being masculine. You know, I think the messages that are put out there through advertising and capitalism, they muddy the waters all the time for what any human being feels like their identity should be. Masculinity is not an easy one. I almost feel like there are no right answers to that question anymore because no matter how I answer it, someone somewhere is going to be upset with it and want to take a pop. But all I know is that there are really good men out there who are good human beings and they're, they're suffering really badly. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason they're suffering. And we need to try and get to the root of that. Absolutely. And um, I suppose in your line of work, Aidan, is that you've encountered a number of misconceptions um, about recovery because you've, you've been championing recovery and, and men's mental health. So if you could kind of identify those misconceptions that you've come across and sort of address them. So, I mean, the, the, the campaign I'm involved in now about tackling the drug death crisis is there's loads of different ways to tackle the problem. So recovery for me is an abstinence-based recovery where I don't use a substance, but recovery for someone else might be that they need to go for a period of harm reduction where they just reduce the amount of drugs that they're using, whatever that drug is. Because for some people, if they're going straight into, straight from a chaotic drug using lifestyle, to abstinence, it could make them more vulnerable and they could end up relapsing and dying. And evidently that seems to be one of the problems in society right now. Recovery as well, as far as my own personal recovery, is made up of many things. It's made up of going to a 12-step fellowship. So that's my abstinence-based fellowship and that's what works for me. It doesn't, it's not like for everyone, but it works for a lot of people and I'm one of the people that it seems to work for. And for me as well, um, education is a massive part of my recovery and writing and finding creative outlets for my, because I'm still an addict, that's the thing. I'm an addict without drugs now and I need to find healthy ways to express myself and, and, and get rid of that energy that's always going on inside of me and writing is one of those things and, and speaking and 
exercise and doing things like going for uh, coffees or climbing my nose and walking outside and sort of connecting with nature and connecting more human beings and getting out my own head and not isolating um, too much because when I isolate too much that's when my head gets a, a bit unwell and not that I'm anywhere near that kind of place in my life now but if I was to do that every day for a large period of time that's where I'd go back to substance abuse again because my illness would start taking over and so all these are aspects of recovery are kind of like my medication you could say uh, absolutely and I, I think it's also important to realize the the role of social support um otherwise you'll just go back to to um to relapse um on your on your addiction and i think uh, another thing that we have to um highlight here is that when we talk about um addiction it's not just um substance addiction but um addiction could exist exist in many other forms you know like like the internet um social media and i'm not gonna lie because this is my line of work um i could be sometimes so obsessed with um, um, the number of likes, the number of subscribers, and the number of views. And to some extent, I think that's also kind of like an addiction itself. But like what I've said, I think um, we really have to, you know, t t t try to achieve balance with, you know, um, the kind of um, lifestyle that we're leaving. Um, another thing that I want to ask you, Aiden, is um, um, you, you've done a lot. Um, you're an author, you're also a campaigner. So is there a particular piece of writing or an individual who has the greatest influence to your, to your work? So this may sound like an odd choice, but the rapper Eminem was the... Him and Kurt Cobain, because they wrote about traumatic feelings and you could see that in some of the lyrics, and, it, it was the first time I realised I could get the pain and trauma I felt inside out through words. Um, so those were massive influences to me. Other influences, um, Urban Welsh, who wrote Chainspot, and I think would have to be the main one because he opened the door for being able to write about Scottish experiences and sometimes quite brutal ones. Um, and also the potential to fictionalise it, but while still telling the real story. Uh, I also would have to say that uh, Darren McGarvey, who's also known as Loki, um, he wrote a book called Poverty Safari, and when he released it, I think he was 33, so he was a young guy and he came from a background of poverty, and a lot of his frustrations were about class, and he was a real influence on me, and he was someone that my lecturers at uni were talking about, and that's kind of how I come to know, know who he was through lectures at uni and it's ironic that someone like him that came from a background of poverty and had his own traumas which he talks about in this book then has an influence over a university class and can then get to be someone like me and then influence me to go on and write as well so yeah there's um a lot of different types of writers i like uh charles Bukowski. um i say that i've only read one of his books a book called post office but it was given to me by a colleague and I just loved how blunt his delivery was and how he could talk about just a normal thing like his job in a post office but make it entertaining to read so yeah these kind of people have influenced me now um Aiden, a lot of people who would be watching this uh, are actually um, um people who might have um the same experience as you so but what's the big message what's what's um one thing you want the public to know about the kind of work that you do I mean, my overwhelming message, I think, wherever I'm talking is that recovery exists. And I mean that in the sense that not just recovery from addiction or substance abuse, recovery from severe mental health, recovery from wanting to kill yourself, because suicide was a big part of my story too. I think one of the messages that I would like to get across is definitely that recovery exists. And if there's something you want to do in life, uh, perseverance, hard work and determination are the greatest assets I have ever had. I'm not naturally academic and I've been to college uni twice and I've written a book and that's purely down to hard work, perseverance and um, determination. That, that was a lovely message, Aidan. And um, on a less um, serious note, um, how do you relax? What's your distressing outlet? So going for walks in nature, I love um, doing my nose, climbing my nose, I love doing going for a cup of coffee with someone I care about and just having a conversation. Music, meditation, playing with my children, 
all those kind of things. Even just getting a good TV show and sitting down for a couple of hours, um, excuse me, with my partner, and um, watching Sam on the telly and unwinding a little bit because we, we live in a highly politicised world at the moment and it can be very stressful, so it's nice to switch off from that sometimes. Absolutely. Those are good range of self-care activities. Um, I myself am so obsessed with Netflix. Well, there's nothing else to do at the moment anyway. That's um, true. Sorry, go ahead. I was just saying that's true. Netflix is the place to go. Yeah, absolutely. And um, what do you think you would be doing if you didn't become an author? I mean, Potentially, if I hadn't found recovery and education, I'd probably be dead by now, and I mean that sincerely. But um, I don't know. I don't know what I'd be doing. Um, I'm studying a social work course, and there's the potential that if I hadn't written the book, I'd have just focused on the course and just went ahead and became a social worker, which I, I still might end up doing. But writing the book has certainly opened up a whole new world to me, and it's made me really think about doing writing as a, a living. But I'm glad to hear that you've managed to, you know, recover from from um, from what you've experienced um, since childhood. And um, finally, what else is in the pipeline? Um, you, you've mentioned that you have an upcoming book, but other than that, um, is there anything else um, um, upcoming with your line of work? And also, what platforms can we get in touch with you at? So for me, um, I'm still heavily involved in the campaigning to change things in Scotland and hopefully the UK as far as addiction. So I'm, I'm involved in that and I'll be staying involved in that until there are changes that are permanent. So we're at the very early stages of that and that'll be my, my long-term plan. Doing public speaking, I'm enjoying doing this, more writing, finishing my social work course, which would have been finished in March, but because of the virus, it's, it's got to wait a few times. So it looks like it'll be finished in the summer. And then come August, I'll, I'll weigh things up, see how things are looking, and, and take it from there. As far as um, platforms, I'm on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and they're all at Aiden Author. Um, you can get me on there. I'll put that on the description box as well, so people can get in touch with you. And ab about speaking engagement, um, uh, I'm quite confident that someone should really book you as one of the speakers, because you've got... Um, a really powerful story to share, especially for um, men's mental health. Well, Aidan Martin, it's a pleasure having you here on the DRH show. And thank you for sharing to us your journey and also about your upcoming book. Um, I look forward to hearing more about, um, about your work. Thank you very much for having me. Pleasure. Thank you.